our service coming to you live from Holy Cross Church for the parishes of Wrighton and Wing Leighton. This is the first Sunday in a while that Richard and I have been just on our own together in church. Most of you who are at home watching us will know that we've taken the decision to suspend in-person worship in our churches for the time being, just because it feels like the safer thing to do. So we're really glad to be able still to be with you online to be able to worship with you so whether you're worshiping with us live or catching up later on youtube you are so welcome uh, to our service this morning we're in the season of epiphany and this morning we're thinking about the baptism of jesus that tremendous event and all that that shows us about who jesus is we're going to begin by singing a great hymn about that event on Jordan's Bank. we settle ourselves in God's presence this morning and allow ourselves to awaken to him we pray together the prayer of preparation almighty God to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. And so as we are quiet before God, Let's allow him to bring to our minds 
those things of which we're not proud, those times when we haven't lived up to his expectations of us, those things for which we need his forgiveness this day. God, be gracious to us and bless us, and to make your face to shine upon us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May your ways be known on the earth, your saving power among the nations. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You, Lord, have made known your salvation and reveal your justice in the sight of the nations. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the Baptism of Jesus Heavenly Father, at the Jordan you revealed Jesus as your Son. May we recognise him as our Lord and know ourselves to be your beloved children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And our second reading is from the Gospel according to St Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. A voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Lord Jesus, as we study your word this morning, may your spirit descend on us as it descended in you, on you in the waters of baptism. May it illuminate our hearts and minds so that we may understand more of you this day. Amen. It's all about identity. In today's Gospel reading, we have two characters, John the Baptizer and Jesus. And Mark is known for the economy of his gospel. It's by far the shortest of all four gospels. 
And his telling of the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection is almost breathless. He's not one for wasted words and detailed descriptions. So the amount of information that he gives us about John the baptizer is quite unusual. Mark tells us that John is clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He even tells us about his diet of locusts and wild honey. And we also get a fair amount of detail about what John is doing, what he's about. And by Mark's standards, this is a well-rounded portrait, so we can imagine John fairly easily. By contrast, we get almost no information about the other character in the passage, which is rather, cons rather surprising considering who it is, Jesus. This is Jesus' first appearance in Mark's Gospel. Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark has no Christmas story, no angels or shepherds or kings, and he certainly has no time for a long, poetical, theological prologue like John's. Mark begins his Gospel blurting out a kind of title, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then he's off like a racehorse out of the starting gate. So when Jesus appears for the first time in verse 9, there's no description of him, no background detail. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the River Jordan. So what the difference in approach to the two characters? Well, one possibility is that Mark assumes that his audience is familiar enough with who Jesus is that he needs no introduction. Another possibility is that in this very short episode, Mark feels that he's told us everything we need to know about who Jesus is. John's identity is described in terms which are familiar to us, even though the man himself might sound rather, well, let's say unusual. But he's defined by what he does, what he wears, what he eats, much as we might define or describe somebody today. But where Jesus is concerned, none of that matters to Mark. Not what he looks like, not what he wears, not what he eats. Only one thing about Jesus' identity is important, that he is the Son of God. And much as we might be curious to know what Jesus looked like, or what he wore, what he ate, or a million other things, Mark doesn't indulge our curiosity. We know what we need to know about who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. Although we celebrated Epiphany last week, the season of Epiphany lasts until Candlemas at the beginning of February. And the lectionary readings in this season are very carefully chosen, each to reveal something about Jesus. That's really what epiphany means. It's a revelation, a sudden flash of understanding, like someone switched a light on, like the classic cartoon moment when someone has an idea and the light bulb appears over their head. And that's literally what epiphany means, to shine light on or around, from the Greek epi, meaning around, and phino, to shine, so epiphino, epiphany. And what Mark does with this passage is to shine a spotlight on the moment of Jesus' baptism and what it reveals about who Jesus is. And what I think Mark wants us to see in his very pared-back account is that there's a direct connection between the baptism and the revelation of Jesus' identity. John has been baptising people in the Jordan before this, calling them to repentance and forgiveness of sins, it's a kind of development of the ritual bathing in Jewish tradition, an outward cleansing to match the inward cleansing of God's forgiveness. But Jesus' baptism is different. He had no need to repent, no need for God's forgiveness. He was, after all, without sin. So what's it about for him? Well, we'll never know the whole answer to that but I wonder whether it was partly about him publicly and deliberately submitting himself to God the Father in baptism at the beginning of his ministry. And it's this act that prompts the rending of the heavens 
the Spirit descending on him and that voice from heaven speaking those amazing words of affirmation. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. I think it's significant that those words are spoken over Jesus at this particular point, before Jesus has done anything. I don't mean to say that his life up to this point and all that he'll have learned about himself and the world are irrelevant or of no value. But the father's affirmation of his son doesn't depend on him having fulfilled his mission or even having begun it. His love is unconditional. The same is true for us as Christians. Our identity is found through our baptism. It's not contingent on anything we might achieve or any particular skills or gifts we might have. Through baptism, we're adopted into God's family. And those words that God spoke over Jesus become words for us too. You are my son. You are my daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Society tends to tell us that what defines us, what affects our worth, are the kind of things that Mark describes about John the Baptist, what we look like, what we wear, the kind of what we achieve. And all too often we fall into that way of thinking and we end up trying to prove ourselves to others and even to God based on what we do, our talents and our skills, what we have to offer. And of course, God can and does use all those things in the service of his kingdom. But that's not the basis of our worth in his eyes. God loves us because God loves us. End of story. We're his precious children, fully accepted as we are, loved utterly and unconditionally. And that's the absolute bedrock of our identity. So many of us struggle with our self-worth. We feel that we're not good enough, kind enough, attractive enough, that we can never do enough or be enough to be acceptable in the eyes of the world. The good news is that God doesn't care about any of that. God tells us that who we are, just as he created us, is enough. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves and one another of that fact. I have a, a bracelet that I wear reasonably often, though I haven't put it on this morning, and stamped on the inside of it are the words, you are enough. And I understand that as working in two directions. Firstly, as God's words of affirmation to me that I am enough, but also as my recognition that God is enough for me, that in him I have everything I need. There are a great many people who need to hear that message, that through baptism God welcomes us into his family as his beloved children, fully accepted and loved unconditionally. Sharing that good news with others should be our response to receiving that love for ourselves. Who do you know who needs to hear those words today? You are my son. You are my daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn now, Come Down, O Love Divine.
So let's declare our faith together in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We're going to turn now to prayer and praying for ourselves and for the world. I'm just going to have a slurp of tea more to warm up my hands than anything else. Those of you who are at home in the, uh, in the warmth, um, you're probably slightly better off than we are this morning. It's quite cold in church. However, let's pray. Jesus calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Washed clean by the waters of baptism, let us pray that we may live the life to which he has called us. Lord Jesus, eternal word, proclaimed as the Christ by John the forerunner, hear us as we pray for all who proclaim your word. We thank you for the reminder of your love and your acceptance of us. Help us to share that word, that message, with those we know, those we meet, who need to hear it, who need to take hold of it for themselves and know that they are enough. We pray for all those whose life's work is to be evangelists, all those who work in churches, who go into schools and different places to proclaim your word, to draw people to you. Lord, bless them and empower them in your work. And bless us and give us confidence also to be those who proclaim your word to others. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, baptising with the Spirit and with fire, Strengthen us to withstand all the trials of our faith. We remember particularly those across the world who are persecuted for their faith in you, for those who are imprisoned and tortured. We thank you for organisations such as Christian Solidarity Worldwide and Open Doors, for the work that they do in raising awareness, calling people to prayer and campaigning for the freedom and the rights of those across the world who believe in you. Lord, here in this country, we're not persecuted in the same way. 
But sometimes it's difficult to be a Christian in our culture. We find ourselves ridiculed and dismissed. Lord, give us strength to stand firm, knowing that in you are the words of life, that we have something worth standing for. We pray for places in our world where what we see is a distortion of your truth and of your gospel. We especially pray at the moment for the United States, remembering those scenes of chaos and violence the other night at the Capitol. For those who hold up banners that say Jesus saves and at the same time think nothing of perpetrating violence towards others. Lord, help us to stand against those kind of distortions of your word. Help us to be those who can love one another, even those who are different from us, so that we can disagree with love and respect. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, bringing forgiveness to all who repent, teach your church dependence on your grace. And Lord, we pray for your church in this time of pandemic, when so many of the churches have made the decision, as we have, not to meet together physically in the same space, as a way of keeping your children safe. Help us to remember that that doesn't mean that we are not your church, that we can meet with you in other ways that don't involve being in the building. Help us to know that we are still knitted together as your body, wherever we find ourselves, wherever we worship, and that we can rely on you to keep us safe and to bring us back together when the time is right. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, fulfilment of the promises of old, give hope to all who suffer or who are ignored. At this time we pray for all who are suffering from the coronavirus, for all those who are in hospital in intensive care, for those who are suffering from other illnesses but aren't able to get the treatment that they need at this time. We pray for all those who are working on the front line, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, all the auxiliary staff, who are stretched to breaking point and beyond. Lord, give them strength and protect them in all that they do. And Lord, may we soon reach the turning point where things will start to improve. We pray too for those for whom the last year has had devastating effects on their finances, on their employment status, those who are finding it increasingly difficult to put food on the table for themselves and their families. We give thanks for all that the government has done in this nation to help, but may they know that there are still people who are falling through the cracks and who need their help. We give thanks for the work of charities and food banks who are doing their very best to catch the people who fall through the cracks and to show them that they too have worth in you. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. 
Lord Jesus, beloved Son of the Father, anoint us with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Lord, there are so many gifts that you give us, so many skills and talents that you call us to use in the service of your kingdom. Lord, in this time when church life and Christian life looks so very different to what we're used to, would you show us how to use those gifts, how to best serve you in this time and in our communities? Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, bringer of hope, share with all the faithful the riches of eternal life. And we remember this day those who have recently died, those who have come home to you. And we pray especially for Jean Pearson and her family as Jean's funeral takes place on Wednesday. We pray for all who mourn, that you would bring them comfort, that you would be the light in their darkness when everything seems hopeless. Lord of truth, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, in you the Father makes us and all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn this morning, that great hymn, one of my absolute favourites, Be Thou My Vision. Richard, is it possible to have the speaker a bit louder?
fact, very nearly the end of our service this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be here at the same time next week. Hopefully we'll be slightly more ready uh, to get started at half past ten next week. There, were, there is also something new that we're starting up from this evening, which is phone church. Um, there's uh, a way that we can do telephone conferencing and we can have a service together. This is aimed particularly at those who aren't able to access our online content. Um, but it is, of course, open to everybody. If you'd like to, to join us for phone church, that's going to be on Sunday evenings at 6 and the details of that are on our websites, so you can find out about that. But if there's anybody that you know of, particularly in either of the parishes, that you know can't access what we're doing online, but might like to be involved in phone church, all you need is a phone line. Um, I've written instructions for how to, how to dial in, how to get connected into that. It should be, please God fairly straightforward. So do please spread the word about that to anybody that you think that that might be a gift to. Um, you can put them in contact with me and I can get them an order of service and the instructions across to them. Richard looks like he's about to say something to me. Oh, and the next technical development. Richard is hoping also to relay these services on a Sunday morning over the phone so that people can actually phone in and listen. So we'll keep you posted on that development. Um, we do, we is putting things into place. I don't understand any of this. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's incredibly good. I'm so lucky to have him um, and all of his technical knowledge. So we'll let you know about that one as well, um, how people can phone in to the morning services as well as the evening. We should be able to do that next week if you didn't hear what Richard was saying, that, was saying there and it should be very similar to how we're operating the evening services so hopefully it should be fairly straightforward to dial in and to be able to listen in to our morning services as well and take part in those. It's all very exciting, all this technology. Um, but we're blessed by the fact that we, that we have it and that we are able to continue meeting even though we can't physically be together in the same space. Let's ask God's blessing on us as we finish. May God the Father, who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light for light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. Amen. May God the Son, who turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. May God, the Holy Spirit, who came upon the beloved Son at his baptism in the River Jordan, pour out his gifts on you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So as we go from this time of worship. Go well, go safely, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.
Oh, my God. 